Hey, this is Jeremy. I'm back. I uh, think it's time to build a transmission. Let's put this thing back together. I've got the M05, M50D completely inspected and all that stuff. Um, we're going to pretend that I have new brass and bearings because I'm not going to rebuild this and this one's just going to go into our stash of transmissions that our general program works on at school. And uh, I'm going to start with putting the hubs and sleeves together with all the keys and springs and things. So each hub has three slots and each slot holds a key which now lives on the floor. And there are springs that go in to press out on the keys. This particular transmission has holes to, uh, I don't know if you indicate, would be to keep the spring in the right location. And that spring just goes in like that and there's one on each side of the uh, hub. Sometimes these can be a neat trick to put together. Um, we're, I'm going to show you the order that I typically do it in. If we look really closely at the inside of this hub, there's some grooves right here. The, these grooves are gonna go where the key is. The key actually rides in that groove right there. And the first stage of synchronization is when the sleeve starts to move over and pushes on that key. And when I get this all together, I'll show you how that goes. You definitely wanna follow the instructions on which way is up and down on these. Um, best I can tell with my, my computer over there, I think I'm in the right order. So I went ahead and put my sleeve on my hub. Now what I like to do is go ahead and drop in all my keys. And so there's a, a raised side of the key and an and a inverted side. The raised side goes into that groove into the hub, or the sleeve, sorry about that. Then I'm throwing my three keys in there. I set one spring on one side and I'm off. the spring will hold the keys. The spring is supposed to hold. Actually I put the spring on backwards. If you put it on right, it'll hold the keys in place. Check this out, here we go. So I'm gonna put one spring in. While that spring holds my keys, I'm gonna flip it over and do my other spring, which also has a hole as soon as I find it. Goes together like that. So if you can notice this, there's the spring in this little hole pressing against the keys and the keys are riding inside here. If you press too far this all shoots across the room and then life gets fun trying to figure out where everything is. So every piece of brass has three little notches in it and those three little notches ride on the keys. So the first engagement or the first stage of synchronization is where it pushes on those keys so the sleeve starts to move up Let's see if i can get closer maybe we'll be able to see without dropping all this garbage when the sleeve starts to move up the actual keys push on the on the brass okay so that's the first stage friction begins to happen between this cone and the actual gear the speed gear the next stage is when the teeth on the sleeve hit the dogs on the brass. That gives you a much more firm engagement. That pushes hard, it, the, pushes the brass hard against the gear. And then the third stage is when we actually start to go into gear. And if I could get my brass lined up correctly, it was lined up right. Definitely, maybe. Or is this not the right piece of brass for this one? That's definitely not the right piece of brass. There we go. There we go, that's the right piece. All right, so then once the gear lines up and reaches the same speed as the output shaft, the, the sleeve will go ahead and slide over actually lock into the gear and that's completed the shift so neutral shifted into gear that's all you get right there but the first engagement is when the keys start to press against the brass then when the second stage 
is when the sleeve starts to press hard against the teeth of the brass and then eventually it goes in the gear. Um, I'll actually post somebody else's video. It's a pretty good video. Watch it. They've made a jig where all this spins and they can go in and out of gear. And you can see that a little bit. So that's how putting your sleeves and stuff together goes. Um, I'm going to skip past that in my instructions. And then let's go to reassembly of the transmission. And according to my instructions over here, it says to lubricate everything with the recommended lubricant. Normally what I would do is I was actually rebuilding this. I just have a little pan or a cup full of whatever transmission fluid this transmission takes. It doesn't smell like 90 weight, so it's probably, it may be just engine oil in this transmission. Let's go up and look. Um, specifications. Threat so their fluid is Mercon ATF. So this one takes ATF for its fluid. Uh, but yeah, so you would just have a cup of ATF laying here and then before you install each piece, go ahead and just dip it in ATF and install it. Um, is normally how I would do that. A cup or a, I have like little cake pans is what I typically use. So first step is our second gear needle bearing. This guy right here is second gear. So my needle bearing goes on. We're going to install second gear. As we put pieces together, especially when we start to press things and put lock rings on, I want to spin everybody who's involved. If uh, you push something on and then the gear that you just put on stops spinning, something's not right. You've installed something incorrectly or maybe something's not aligned. Um, but yeah, that's a good time to go back and check and see what's going on. Install the different pieces of this uh, synchronizer. So the inner cone just kind of floats in there. Then we have this piece that spins with the gear. It's got four teeth on it, as you can see, and they line up with four holes in the gear. So you want to make sure they lay down in their little holes. So now they're spline to the gear. The top blocking ring goes on. You notice this one has six slots in it, and it matches the six slots in that inner cone. And so they all lock together. Install the blocking ring, we got that. So let's go to the 2-3 sleeve, which has thrust surface on the back side. That's first gear there, so that's this guy. Thrust surface facing up, it says. I'm not in love with this process right now. I don't feel like that's it. It's definitely this one. Some pictures upon disassembly would have made this a little bit easier. So that's the right one. And when I get it on, I want to make sure that my keys are lined up with the piece of brass and that the brass only wiggles inside the uh, slot and the key where the keys are. So I put that guy on. Um, first gear blocking ring. Let's get first gear over here. Again, you want to line it up with the keys. First gear needle bearing. Needle bearing or race? That's cool. It never says to install the race. It just assumes that you know that the race is going to go with the needle bearing. So, first gear race and needle bearing. No. What are you doing to me here? I got it. I'm not doing it their way. They want you to put the needle bearing, then the gear, then the race. We're going to go about that a different way. I'm going to put the needle bearing and the race on at the same time. That way it was easy to align. This one didn't get a BB, so I don't have to worry about lining anything up there. Um, now they want me to press on an out the output shaft bearing that I ended up prying off the other day. I'm going to stop here, I'm going to take this to the press, and then I'm going to press that bearing on, even though I took it off um, with screwdrivers, it doesn't go back on as easy as it comes off. So I'm going to press it back on, so I'm going to stop here. Alright, so I'm back. 
I've, I've got my bearing pressed onto the back of the shaft here. Uh, I've got no thrust play uh, for first gear there, so that's nice. Well, I have a little bit of thrust play. We'll measure that in a minute, uh, but nothing scary. So now it wants the third gear needle bearing, which is here. It wants third gear. Oh, that's not the way that goes. It goes like that. Third gear goes on. So third gear brass. And this was the fibrous one. He goes on there. Then we got our three, four shift hub or hub and sleeve coming up next. And this guy just splines on the right. And then I'm going to turn it till my keys are lined up again and push down. Now then I get a little thrust sleeve guy there. I get a lock ring that pushes against that sleeve. Flip it over. And grab him, slide him down. Make sure he slaps into his little home. Definitely, maybe. It may require a little assistance. Missed. There it goes. Just gave it a little help so that it would jump down into its uh, little groove. Third gear still spins, second gear still spins. Uh, nobody's loose, which feels good. Third gear brass is spinning. I have a thrust bearing for the input shaft, which lives right here. And he's gonna wanna fall off and make my life miserable. So what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of grease and stick it where he goes. And then now it's stuck on there and we can do like a blizzard at Dairy Queen and flip it upside down and it doesn't fall out. So that just a little tip to make your life easier. All right. It wants us to check the clearance for, oh, it wants us to check it without the sleeve. That doesn't make any sense. Using a feeler gauge check in play. If the clearance is not within specifications, select a snap ring. Well, let's go see what specifications are since you didn't tell me. Okay. Third to fourth hub in play is zero to one thou or zero to one point nine thou. So let's call it zero to two thou. Let's say it's tight. I drove it on with a, with a punch. So we're going to assume that one's tight because I don't think I even have a one thou feeler gauge. Negative. Yep, that's not gonna happen. It's tight. Now let's go back to where we were. Install needle brain, we got that done. So that shaft is assembled now. Now we can go grab our case, throw this one in the case. Or start putting our case and stuff back together. How about that? Install the counter shaft. Do not install the counter shaft front or rear bearings at this time. All right, let's grab us a housing here. And hopefully you can see what's going on there. Looks pretty good. I'm just going to set the counter shaft down into the transmission. And we don't want to put the bearings in because we want it to sit down low to allow us to install, give us some space to install the next gear, the shafts. Position the input shaft into the transmission. It shows it with the pocket bearing installed, so we're going to go ahead and install it. Get him in as far as he'll go. All right, so we've got our cluster gear in, our input shaft is in. Now it wants us to install our output shaft. This may be a neat trick. 
but we'll give it a go. So this guy's gonna sneak in here like this. We're gonna do our best now not to smash our fingers like that. And then we're gonna line it up with our input shaft, maybe. Be nice. There we go. So my input shaft is lined up with my output shaft. My piece of brass for the for fourth is in its little grooves and everybody's happy. So it says install the center counter shaft bearing. It's going to take me a minute to figure out which bearing is which after it's been on the table for a few days. Uh, this is center counter shaft bearing. That's this one. It goes in like this. Definitely more. Okay, install the output shaft center bearing. Race, it says bearing, but it means race. And the smaller one of the When you're putting these races in, you wanna go in perfectly straight. If you get them in crooked, you can really damage the case and get one of these stuck in there. Um, best thing to do is just very gently tap on the high portion of the bearing, the part that's sticking out the most. Otherwise, these guys can make your life miserable. And just take your time and it'll go in easy like that. And of course my cluster bearing falls back out because he's a jerk. Back in he goes. Do my same hammer trick here. Of course, every time you move one of these, everybody else starts to fall out. So until you get the bearing retainer in, this can be kind of fun. All right. Output shaft center bearing is installed. Install the bearing retainer with the arrow pointing to the top of the case. So this is my, oh, check it out. He's got an arrow pointing to the top. Bye. Grab my bolts. Um, you want to be careful. These screw into aluminum, and if you over torque them, you can pull the threads right out of the case, which can basically make a case useless. So be mindful to what you're going to do. I'm going to put mine in with cordless because this is not going back in a car. It's going to speed up our video a little bit, but there are torque specs in here, and you should definitely, if I was putting this into a car, I would most certainly. I would actually use a speed handle and a torque wrench. I might use a speed handle anyways. Just to make sure I don't damage anything. Give that bearing a little extra push. And there she goes. Let's grab a speed handle. When I'm building engine and transmission, engines and transmissions, I typically use a speed handle to tighten things to get to the point where the torque wrench is ready to go. Uh, mainly because it's very difficult to over torque something with a 
speed handle and it's super easy to do it with your cordless impact. Get this guy out here. And I'm gonna just walk these in easy all the way around just to make sure that nobody gets bound up and causes any issues. I've never seen anybody over torque something with a speed handle except for maybe a transmission bolt. Or on a pan. This is the original cordless impact. So those are all the 15 foot pounds with my hand operated torque wrench there. Let's uh, see what's next. So let's put in a new front seal in the front cover. Uh, front seal is pretty easy on these. You just set it in the vise and drive it out with the socket or something and press your new one back in. It's a walk in the park. And we'll put in our uh, thrust washers they had as well as this um, it's not a slinger, it's, a, it's just a seal to keep oil away from the front seal. Position the transmission with the bell housing facing up. Okay, I've got my transmission set up on a motorcycle stand. Uh, it's not the most stable thing on the planet, but I don't think it's gonna fall over. Uh, first step now is it wants us to put the counter shaft front bearing in. So let's see if we can sneak this guy in there without being mean. Shaft's got to move a little bit. May require some assistance. Let's turn the radio down a little bit too. Okay, that's good now. Again, just going to tap on the high spots and just walk it down into its little hole. Slides right in. That was easy enough. Push it all the way on the fingers. All right, it says, install it, measure the input shaft bearing race height. So what it wants me to do is use the tail end of my dial caliper to measure the distance from the flat portion of the bearing retainer to the actual race. So we're gonna measure that distance. I've got 159 thou. It says put it into the shim chart to choose the right shim. Okay. Output shaft in play. That's output shaft. I want input shaft in play. Hmm. Instructions are about as clear as mud on this one. Oh, they're not telling him it. I don't know. Either way, I've got my shim here. What we had, we had 159 thou. My shim measures 138 thou, 137 thou. So 159 minus 138. So at 21 thou, did I got that right? Yeah, 21 thou. And let's see what our specification was for that. We'll just compare the specs without using their little chart. Countershaft in play is six to 10 thou. That can't be right. This is the one they wanted. My rear bearing retainer is installed. Countershaft end play is six to 10 thou. So ours is gonna be a little loose. Uh, we'll remeasure just to double check. Uh, maybe I measured it wrong the first time. I got a little better measurement that time. My bearing is pressed down good. Set this guy flat on the surface there. 
There we go, I can live with this. I'm at 150 thou. And then we'll go back and measure 137 again. So we're at 12 thousandths, we're a little bit over. So we really ought to put in a little thicker shim to bring this one into specifications because we're gonna have a little bit of excess in play on the counter shaft. All right, so that kind of shows you what that shim does. So we need to put in our bearing race for the input shaft, which is right here. Maybe. Gonna have to have some uh, inertia assistance. Just gonna gently tap this guy down and make sure he never gets crooked. Okay, so let's go to measure that fella, see how he works. All right, so this time, I'm gonna measure from the face of the bearing race down to the case of the transmission. And we've got a 155 thou this time. And then it wants me to measure the depth of the groove that my, my uh, shim sits in. I'm gonna do the same thing I did a while ago. I'm gonna ignore their chart. I'm gonna put my shim in and measure that distance. And we're just gonna calculate our end play and go from there. So I have got 169 thou there. And we're gonna do this one again. Come on now. Hundred and sixty thousand, so nine thousandths of hundred and sixty one, eight thousandths of in play. Let's see what the output shaft's in play spec is. Output shaft maximum in play is two to six thou. So we're a little bit over on that one too. So there's a little bit of wear in the bearings uh, and the thrust surfaces inside this transmission. Uh, so if we were going to do this one correctly, we would also want to take and put in a thicker shim here. And there is actually a chart to tell me the, I, wanna, I don't know if it had part numbers. It just had thicknesses of the particular shims. So we would wanna go, we would wanna take three or four thou out of this one to get it into specs, especially with it having tapered roller bearings on the main shaft. Um, tighter is gonna be better in that scenario. So now it wants to install the front bearing retainer. What does it call this piece right here while we're at it? A fluid baffle. Okay, I'll buy that. Install your fluid baffle. That uh, limits the amount of fluid that hits the front seal. Now, normally we would clean this surface up very well, um, shoot it with some brake clean and get it nice and dry and clean, no oil on it on both the case and the front bearing retainer. And this on this transmission, this guy is sealed on with RTV. This transmission uses ATF as its lubricant. So if you wanted to use an RTV type sealant that is um, for transmission fluid, that would be perfect for this scenario. Uh, Toyota does have one. The red uh, FIPG, is what a form in place gasket is what you would use. Uh, but put him on. bolt this guy down. Again, I'm going to use my speed handle. Make sure I don't get into any trouble. The threads are going to aluminum again. Let's see if I'm good enough to do this today. The threads are a little bit nasty. And if this were a live rebuild, I would go ahead and torque these to spec right now. As soon as I finish running them all up, 
touching with the uh, speed handle, but I'm going to use my handheld uh, torque wrench here. We're going to put them all to about 15 to 20 foot pounds. Can you hear it click through this microphone? Because it's clicking. All right, there's that. So what's next? Okay, we're going back on the bench with this guy. All right, so I got my transmission back on the bench. It wants me to reinstall my little fluid deflector thing. So this tube splines into a hole in the front of the case. We'll stick it in here. Uh, just a bolt that locates it and holds it on. I'm gonna switch to my impact just cause. All right, so that guy's tight. Click with the torque wrench. It's tight on there now too. Um, fluid passage bolt is installed. Does it say to put any sealant on that? Apply a small amount of silicone sealant on the threads. Okay, so this, since, since this bolt goes through the transmission case, you can see it had some RTV on it from before. Um, that way this don't, it doesn't leak transmission fluid from that bolt. So usually these ones that go through the case like that will get some a small amount of RTV of some sort on it. All right, install fifth gear. Stand this guy up. I am going to check my angle. That'll work. All right, and I learned the other day that it is better to put this lever in prior to putting in fifth gear, even though they tell you to. So, I'm gonna jump to the instructions to see if I can, it only goes one way, you can't do it wrong. This is the lever that moves the shift fork for third and, not third, reverse and fifth. It has a little th thrust washer to protect the, the E-ring on it, or the clip that holds it on. I'm gonna locate my snap ring pliers which are officially hiding. Here they are. Flat side up. It's in its groove and it's happy. That's that part. Now let's jump back up to fifth gear. Okay, fifth gear, driven gear goes on. Judging by the image, it goes like that. Ah, I'm not buying that. That's much better. It was gonna rub the case if I put it on the other way and I'm not okay with that. Install the following. The locating ball, inner race, fifth gear, split bearing. Okay. I got a little ball. Oh, that goes on this other shaft. That is gonna be most difficult for you to see. So it wants me to install the ball that handles, that keeps the race from spinning on fifth gear. So I'm gonna take a little grease and I'm gonna apply it into the hole where the ball goes. And then while I still have some grease on my finger, I'm gonna stick the ball to my finger maybe and then go down here and stick it in that hole, maybe. And the grease will keep that ball from falling out while I'm messing with this race. So, fifth gear is here. Here's my race. Again, my race has this little slot in it that lines up on the ball. So you sit it in a spot and turn it till it rests on that ball and stops spinning. Um, we got a split bearing goes in and the fifth gear goes in. I'm going to go ahead and install it with the bearing in it just because I like doing it that way. All right. Everybody spins and look happy. I've got my blocking ring for fifth resting on there. Okay, there goes the rear fork. 
blocking ring is installed. Now it wants the hub and sleeve for fifth. Um, let's see if I can swing you over a little bit. And maybe you can see me this put this guy back together without the camera falling on the floor. Okay. So what I like to do is take these keys out and the springs out, put it all in kind of in order. All right, there's my hub. Here comes my sleeve. And I gotta make sure my little grooves line up with my slots in the hub. Drop my keys in their little holes. Gonna install the spring for one side. Flip this guy over, install the spring for the other side. As soon as I find the little hole it lines up with. Okay, hub and sleeve put together. The reverse shaft has a hole from a bolt inside the case that held the shaft steel. So that's an easy way to tell you which way is up and which way is down on this. And it shows up with the smooth side facing up on that. I hope I got that right. We'll find out in a second. I know I got it right now that I'm looking at it. Okay, let's smooth you back over to where you can see the transmission. So all you got to do is line up the splines on the hub to the reversed shaft with its hole. The actual fork that makes that, or the lever that makes that fork move. Oh, nice. Drop all of it in there at exactly the right time. Um, then you gotta get the blocking ring lined up from underneath with the keys. There it goes, come on, get in there. All right. My blocking ring is lined up, it only turns a little bit. We're gonna give it a little tap down so that we can get our half moons in that lock this guy in. That hub is held on with these two little half moons, which are pretty cool. So they just slide into the groove in the shaft and that's what holds that hub in place. And then there is a cool little thrust washer it has a groove that once you slide it over those half moons, they can't come out. They're, they're captured in there, which is kind of neat. All right, let me get to my instructions. Let's see what else we got. Okay, so our reverse bolt. There you go. Just bump the camera, it'll be fine. There was a hole in that shaft that lines up where this bolt goes in. And it is the funny looking bolt that has a pin on it to line up reverse. We'll spin him over here. And I'm gonna do it by hand because I don't want to damage it if I'm not perfectly lined up on this shaft. There we go. I had to wiggle the shaft a little bit and the bolt will go right in. Take, and again, this one's gonna get a little bit of RTV on the, on the bolt to seal it to the case. And there's reverse. So it wants to check the end play of this hub with feeler gauges. And again, we're talking zero to two thou. I don't even have a two thousandths uh, feeler gauge, but let's assume I did. They would want you to check the clearance between that hub and the little half mount. Um, this one fits pretty tight, so I'm going to say that's good. All right. My reverse speed gear is going to go on. 
So it's got two caged bearings and a blocking ring for reverse. I'm gonna go ahead and set, ooh, reverse got fiber too, that's cool. I didn't notice that on disassembly. Most cars don't have synchronizers for reverse, so they grind going in reverse. And this one has spiral cut gears. Most cars don't have spiral cut gears, so they whine in reverse, um, which is kind of cool. All right. So it says install the reverse blocking ring, the two bearings, the counter shaft reverse gear. Measure the reverse gear in play. Well, they forgot to tell you to put on the ring that holds it. And actually it wouldn't be the, it is the ring. How on earth are you gonna do that? These instructions are not awesome. It wants you to measure something that is, oh, there it is. Hey, looky there. So there's the correct thrust. You want to, <laughs> it has you measuring with a feeler gauge the thrust between this uh, washer that is not captured. That's a pretty good waste of time. Now then, output shaft spacer goes on there. It wants me to install the output shaft reverse gear, which goes there. Install the reverse gear idler and bushing. Now then, remember the reverse gear shaft uh, bolts through the side of the transmission case over here. Again, we would put a little bit of RTV on this bolt that would uh, keep it from leaking. What size is that? There we go. Did you hear the torque wrench click on that? Because I used a torque wrench on that. If this were a live rebuild, I would definitely, because you don't want that reverse shaft coming loose when it's driving that would be ugly so torque that spec when you do it okay so i've got my thrust washer for reverse either it's got a little tang on it that keeps it from spinning and it's got to line up on a slot in the shaft so put that guy on there then my reverse either gear goes in it's got a pair of cage bearings be nice. Be nice. Get in there. All right. Everybody spins. Now then. Ooh, and it wants you to put, um, it says put thread locker and sealant on that. So it wants you to put um, Loctite on the threads of that reverse idler bolt so that it doesn't vibrate out. That's a good idea. So I've got a thrust washer there for the reverse either, and I've got a lock ring that holds him on. As soon as I find the right pliers. Flip that over, go that way. Okay. Reverse is on there. Um, there should be a measurement for the thrust there. It's not showing me to inspect it, but it's another one of those spots where you could go in and measure the thrust on the reverse idler there. Okay. Now then, it wants you to... Position the output shaft rear bearing on the output shaft using the old output shaft lock nut. Install the output shaft rear bearing, then discard the nut and install a new nut. Huh, that's kind of cool. So, I'm going to put the bearing on. I did this the other day. This does actually work. All right, so take three of reassembling the tail end of this transmission after a dead camera battery and uh, no audio. Let's see if we can't get this stuff finished up. 
Um, I'm not going to use the laptop. I've done it three times now, so I should have this memorized pretty well. So first thing we're going to do is throw the counter shaft rear bearing on and it has a nut that gets torqued to spec. You're supposed to put it in two gears at one time and then torque it to, I don't know how many foot pounds, whatever it said in the service manual. So I have my torque wrench set there. And then uh, this nut has a spot where you're supposed to peen it so that it won't come loose. Um, so you would normally peen this. Now then, <clears throat> excuse me, has a little plastic cap that causes fluid flow to stay in there or holds fluid. Um, now then, my tone ring for my speed sensor has a BB that keeps it centered on the output shaft. And again, I stuck some grease in it uh, to hold the BB while we're working. And my tone ring has a little groove in it that lines up with that ball to keep it from spinning on the shaft. All right, now there's a lock ring that goes on to hold this guy in place. Maybe. All right, lock ring in, so that got captured. And there's a little rubber damper of sorts. I'm not sure what these do. I've seen them in several transmissions and it just sits there on the end of the splines where the drive shaft stabs onto this critter. So normally we would have cleaned up this uh, gasket surface here very well and then hit it with some brake cleaner right before we put RTV on it. Same thing for the extension housing. Uh, we'll clean this whole surface. Uh, one or the other is going to get glued with RTV. Now then, when you put this extension housing on, it's got to align with the counter shaft bearing, the output shaft bearing, the fifth reversed shift shaft, and then uh, the reverse either shaft all has to line up. So you can't force this on. You may have to wiggle to get it to sit down on there right and then uh, install it. Never force it down with the bolts. You want it to go all the way on, on its own. Like that. So we'll put some bolts in this guy. There was one stud here. There was one stud up here in this corner the other day. And the rest were just bolts. Again, I would normally use my speed handle to install these and then torque them to spec with the torque wrench, especially because they're going into an aluminum housing. Let's see if I can find a cordless with the battery. So I'm gonna run them in with my cordless. You hear a click. So we got those torqued on. I'll flip this guy over. It's in time to install our shifter housing. So with all my shift forks in their neutral position and all your sleeves in the neutral position, have this surface clean. Uh, we've got our, if we had a new O-ring, we put a new O-ring in there. We have to stab the two forks into the sleeves up here and this little lever for fifth and reverse into a slot right here. So this may take a little trick to get it to sit down in there, right? If you don't ever get everybody stabbed right, one, it won't work, and two, it may not go down right. So if that doesn't go on easy, something's, something's not right. I'll throw some bolts in this guy. Speed handle with the torque wrench. And then finally our shifter goes in. Maybe. 
There she goes. Okay, so that's not long enough for me to be able to shift this by hand. And normally in the truck, it would have like a 24 inch lever, which would give me a lot of leverage over this. Um, I can kind of move it, but it's a lot of work. When you're sitting on the bench with a tr manual transmission, they don't just run through all the gears real easy like. What you would uh, do if you did want to run it through the gears, you'd have to spin it at the same time. And I can't get mine to even hardly move without the top half of the shifter bushings. Uh, because this is all designed to spin and shift, not shift sitting still. Um, so if it doesn't shift real easy on the bench, that's probably normal. Um, at this point, everything should spin pretty easy. I would obviously want to check in play here. Um, I could, we'd have to throw a dial indicator here and measure that. Uh, this one feels pretty good. It would be nice to be able to check in play back here, but there's nothing really to grab onto to move the output shaft. So since the output shaft and the input shaft are in the same plane, we're going to just use that one measurement from the front on that. But uh, that's pretty much it for putting this transmission together. This transmission is pretty simple to do. Um, I wouldn't be scared. To, this is what we use in our general program as M5ODs to teach uh, the general students uh, because it's a pretty easy transmission. It's got a cool range of parts inside of it uh, to explain how different types of synchronizers and stuff work. But yeah, so if you want to learn how to make some money in a uh, essential field, um, look us up at eastfieldcollege.edu. If you're interested in making some real money with Toyota, um, look at t-ten.com. And if you need transmission cores, transmission parts, engine parts, check out Bishops International. There's links to all three of those websites in the descriptions for this video. Um, if you want to see more videos like this, we've got uh, transfer cases, CV axles, rear differentials coming up soon. So uh, click like and subscribe and thanks for watching guys.